KB, what's up, dude? Yo, what's up, man? How are you? Thanks for having me, dude. Absolutely, man. It's uh, I, I've I've come and smoked a few of your classes. Uh, you know, gone back and done some beers at Bowen stuff. So now I wanted to to have you on. This is this was like when we were doing Kevin's Corner together, and I know you still are doing Kevin's Corner. Go uh, for those like NFL, especially Colts. Uh, wherever you get your podcast, Kevin's Corner uh, available. He covers uh, the Colts better than anybody. But when we were doing it together, this was like our week, man. This is this is the Super Bowl. This is Christmas morning, to say the least. Like, you know, I'm hoping Maddie can let me creep down a few more steps on Thursday morning because I'm so giddy about, yeah. honestly, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I don't know. There's something about just, and you and I are such big college football fans as well. There's just something about this week that I absolutely love and all the unknown and whatnot. So uh, I know you're giddy about it, and that, as am I, man. Right. So uh, follow follow Kevin at kbowen1070 on Twitter for the latest um, on the Colts, anything NFL. But let's get into it, man. Chris Ballard spoke, what was it, on Friday? Yep. On mm -hmm. Friday, and then he did his pre-draft presser, and we know how Chris Ballard is. You know, nobody's better at the mic than him. What did you take away from that? What are you expecting from this weekend um, from what you heard from Chris Ballard? Yeah, I thought it was pretty smoke screening, to be honest with you, from him. Um, maybe more so than I remember in past years, you know, compared to what Jim Ursay says last week when Ursay's saying, oh, yeah, we need, a, you know, third corner. We only have two corners. And, you know, Ballard's probably in his office like, dude, what are you doing? Like, do not say that. Um, but he certainly is – he'll answer the questions in the most politically correct way without giving, I think, too much. So left tackle, edge rush, corner, um, I, I think all those are needs. Uh, but I do feel like with only two picks in the first, I think, 125 – they would love to trade back. And I know that's not breaking news to you because you know how Chris Ballard operates. But considering that not only do you only have those two picks in the one top 125 this year, you know, in all likelihood, your first rounder is going to Philadelphia next year for that Carson Wentz trade. So I do think, you know, number 21 overall, that could look like number whatever, 29, 30 overall for the Colts in their first pick. Okay, so you are expecting, even if they do trade back, that it won't be like uh, what we experienced a couple of years ago where we didn't have yeah. any draft pick on Thursday night. So you're expecting them, even if they trade back, you'll be able to have a, a, a press conference on Thursday night talking about the pick. I mean, selfishly, maybe I'm just talking from that side of it. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. But, like, in all seriousness, I mean, trading back from 21 all the way out of the first round, I mean, that's that's a big drop. You know, when they did it a couple of years ago when, when you and I were doing the pod, I mean, that was 26, though. Uh, they ended up having the 34th overall pick that year. So I think if you go from 21 to, you know, Buffalo has been a popular team that you know, might trade up and take a running back that your Steelers might might like, you know, something like that. Um, I think it's beneficial to get that late first rounder to have that rookie on the fifth year team option. I mean, not to get too nitty gritty in the contracts of it, but I do think that's a big benefit. And, you know, even if you move back 10 spots, eight spots, something like that, you can still get you know, a third round draft pick in this class or maybe even, you know, a second round or next year. Yeah. Why do you think that national media folks continue to slot a wide receiver in the first round to the Colts? When are they ever going to learn? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't get that. Um, to me, I feel like what the Colts have operated with this offseason, they've almost kind of pigeonholed themselves into this left tackle, edge rush, maybe corner um, sort of predicament here the one thing I do find interesting with wideout is this Jim Mersey seemingly came in at kind of the final minute final hour and told T.Y. Hilton hey we're up in the number for you here you go here's one year 10 million T.Y. said that the number that Chris Ballard originally told him was not at the level that he wanted and he felt like he was going to go to Baltimore so if you take that information, and obviously Ballard is running the draft, and sure, Jim Mersey has some say in it, but I think he's giving Chris Ballard freedom to make the selection. If Chris Ballard doesn't view T.Y. Hilton as one year, $10 million, and he views T.Y. Hilton in a little bit of a smaller number, does that mean that wideout is a bigger need in Ballard's eyes, mm -hmm. uh, Frank Reich's eyes? Now, that might be me overthinking it a little bit. I still don't expect wideout at 21. But I'll say this, if for some reason one of those Alabama kids is there at 16, 17, 18, oh, boy. Um, 
I'd be thinking long and hard about moving up for that guy because you got to remember, T.Y. Hilton is, you know, 31 years old, and Paris Campbell has not shown an ability to stay healthy in the NFL. What about a guy like Kadarius Tony from Florida? I love him, man. I, I don't know if it was just like, again, I was craving college football so much in the fall, but I felt like I watched so much Florida this year. Yeah, they were on a lot. Yeah, I vividly remember Florida Ole Miss, maybe like the first game of the year that I was watching. And I really like Tony. I mean, um, I really like Rondell Moore, to be honest with you as well. I mean, I, I feel like Rondell Moore plays a lot bigger than his size. Yeah, sure. I, I feel like his ability to make some plays after the catch is not just all pure speed, which he does have that quick first step. But you know, guys like Tony, guys like Rondell Moore, guys like Elijah Moore from Ole Miss, those are three guys kind of in the similar mold a little bit wide out wise. It, you know, if I were a team in the 20s, I'd be thinking long and hard. And I, I don't know, maybe even Tony doesn't even get to the 20s if he's that fourth wide out off the board. What are you hearing or what are you thinking about who they like uh, up front in terms of left tackle? Do they, you know, I've I, obviously it's a pretty, from what I've read and, and done research on, a pretty deep left tackle, pretty deep offensive lineman draft. So there's a bunch of names out there. But who are you feeling like Chris Ballard kind of has his eyes on and, and likes if they're going to go that route? Yeah, I feel like the most popular name we've seen is Christian Darisau out of Virginia Tech. Now, the question is, um, you hear the, 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 the term lazy with him as like the biggest negative. Now, um, is that just any sort of big guy that whatever can dominate his opponent for 90% of the game and 10% of the film? You're just kind of like, oh, man, I wish he was, you know, whatever, Walter Jones for the entire game. Um, and then part of me thinks you put him next to Quentin Nelson and his laziness just go out the window. And he's got to play to the whistle, you know, snap and a snap out. The guy that I just – and I just posted my my mock draft earlier today. I have him taking Sam Cosme out of Texas. Now, is 21 a little bit early? Probably. But I made a rule that there were no trades because trades complicate things and it's too early in the morning for me to be worried about that. So, sure. I don't know. Maybe you trade back five, ten spots and you still get him. But I feel like that athletic trait, I mean, you know Chris Ballard. You've, you've obviously had him on. He's obsessed with those traits. And you know, Cosme tested very well, played left tackle at Texas, was a captain. And a lot of this stuff might sound a bit cliche, but if you look at Chris Ballard draft picks, they fit a bit of a blueprint there. So um, I, I really like Tevin Jenkins at Oklahoma State. The question for me is can he play left tackle? Sure. And, you know, the Colts, you know, have that need there with Anthony Costanza's retirement. So – um, there is how it, 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 if he gets there, but Cosme might be a little bit more realistic, especially in a trade back. Is there what what percentage would you put it at? Um, because we know how Chris Pallard loves to not only build up front on offense <laughs> and defensively as well. I mean, nobody likes to you know get those three techniques and the defensive linemen and linebackers like Chris Ballard, you know, is there any chance that at 21 we're all thinking it's going to be left tackle and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you get a Zayvon Collins or, um, you know, an Alabama defensive lineman? Dude, I think it's a great point that you make. I, You know, you feel like the recent momentum is when is the first defensive player coming off the board? Yeah. I mean, people are saying maybe not even in the top 10. So, and, and I don't think it's like it's a bad defensive draft. I mean, by all accounts, the cornerback class is very deep. DN has some, you know, nice first round talent back into the first round. Linebackers have some intriguing names. You mentioned Collins, Micah Parsons as well. So, you know, corner, I, I, I keep on coming back to what Ursay said a couple of weeks ago. And like, Ursay just doesn't say that just to say it, you know, sure. He, he's getting that from somebody and somebody that's rather important. And the name I keep coming back to is Greg Newsom out of Northwestern. Um, you know, I, I assume Patrick Sertan and um, J.C. Horn will go early um, or earlier than the Colts at 21. Caleb Farley, to me, it's just a medical thing that, I, I don't know, backs worry me and maybe because I always have a bad back, but it just worries me. So Newsom um, played in a scheme that wasn't like heavy man, heavy press in Northwestern, still found the ball a lot with like passes defense. Um, just seems like a pretty clean prospect, a little bit banged up in college, but nothing too crazy there. And if he's available at 21, and if you're thinking, because to me it's like you need to solidify a line and you need to get an impact pass defender. Now, I think pass defender is more edge rush than corner, but if they think it's corner, Newsom at 21, that's the one that I keep on coming back to of like, if he's there, 
you know, maybe they don't trade back. Um, so I, I, I do think it's a good point that you bring up of if this offensive run goes with the QBs, the wideouts, you know, um, Sewell, Slater, um, those guys, does that push a corner, an edge rusher, you know, down the board a little bit? Does, I mean, I, I guess you can't really do this, but uh, Rakasin has been very up and down to put it best um, since they took him in, what was that, 2019? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 2019 with their first overall pick, which was when they traded back out of the first round. Mm-hmm. D- d- does – that give them any sort of hesitancy with corner or are they just going to say, yeah, if we really like this guy, we need that position. We, we got to go with a guy like Newsom. Yeah. You know, it's funny when Ballard was asked about corner last week, he sounded like Rocky scenes agent and and, and he often does, you know, just continue to bank on high character, this and that. And I'm like, that's great. But like, I consider myself a decently nice human being, but like at the end of the day, <laughs> character only gets you so far. Like you need some dudes that can, that, that can play football. So um, it, it sounded to me a bit smokescreenish. Like, yes, they do like rock. I think better than like most fans maybe do at this point, but mm-hmm. at the same time, you know, I just, no GM is going to be brutally honest with you six days before the draft and say, Oh yeah. Corner glaring need without a doubt. We got to yeah in that first round pick at at corner so now the only devil's advocate i have to that is in this defense which is heavy zone i don't feel like there's a need for this true elite abundance of corners yes it would be beneficial um and obviously if you look at the pittsburgh film you know full well from that game uh, there were some struggles there in the in the back end i also think if you can disrupt timing from the front with the front four and you drop seven in zone that is better for this football team. Yeah, I mean, hey, be- best way to make a corner look good is have them not cover for very long, right? right. <laughs> so get your guys who get after the quarterback. Um, yeah. Is there any I, – I know that it's been a Twitter discussion. I think Jim Irsay addressed it on JMV show uh, about Quentin Nelson moving to left tackle. Anything there? Uh, is that a possibility still or no? Yeah, I'm not like slamming the door shut on it just yet. I mean, I think, again, in an ideal world, you'd find the left tackle of the future in the draft. But, you know, Ballard, and, and I don't think this is smokescreen, which this is just the story of my life right now. I'm sure you do the same thing. <laughs> this is like, do I believe what he said? Do I not believe what he said? Do I believe what he said? You know, um, since January, he's really been like, let's just find the five best offensive linemen. And I know that's super cliche and, like, very coach speaky, but I do think that, like, if the right opportunity presents itself to to get that defender early or something like that, they've added a bunch of offensive line depth this off season. It's, it's an emergency plan that they wouldn't be like, this is DEF CON and going to it. So again, I'm not all in on it, but I haven't like totally ruled it out just yet. Do you give any, I saw Peter King or yeah, I think it was Peter King who reported that um, they, they did reach out to Andrew Luck before they traded for Carson Wentz. Uh, at what point what, – what, does Carson Wentz just have to win the Super Bowl this year to finally get him to close the door officially on Andrew Luck? Or will, will Jim Irsay always have that door a little bit open? Dude, always. Always, <laughs> always, always. It, it is the ex-girlfriend that you think about and you like, wow, I'm searching her. Like a white whale. Right. right. I'm searching her on Instagram for a fifth straight day. Look at me and my girlfriend sitting, you know, two feet away from me on the couch. Like it, it's, it's so funny how like, you know, so, so many of my colleagues, I feel like are like, Hey, we need to slam the door shut, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, the owner doesn't slam the door shut. Like he's the one that always is throwing in these little, well, you never know. MJ played baseball for two years. It came yeah. back like this and that. So yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, yeah, uh, Carson Wentz is going to have to take this team on deep, deep playoff runs. I feel like for Jim Mersey to really feel bad, feel like there's no chance. Now, I do believe this, man. Jim Mersey is like super high on Carson Wentz. Yeah, and and I know Jim Mersey is, you know, he's optimistic, you know, every single day. But like, he, I, I I do believe that he's all in on Frank Reich's belief on Carson Wentz. I've had a few people ask me yesterday and then, you know, Peter King dropped it in his um, football morning in America uh, that Julio Jones is, is, you know, the Falcons are kind of shopping him or at least listening to, to offers. 
Um, would the Colts be interested at all? I, I said no yesterday just because in my head I'm thinking – guy that's been banged up, a guy that's aging, a guy that's going to cost you a lot. And, and you know, Chris Ballard hasn't been that great with wide receivers, nor is it a position that he's really focused on. So all those things, I said no. What, what do you think? Yeah, I would go there as much as I'd love to put on my, you know, Madden video game hat and, and pull that off. You got to think back to the draft pick stuff we talked about earlier. I mean, you only have six this year for Chris Ballard. That's just a super small amount. Uh, next year, you only have six right now, and you potentially are losing your first rounder. So I know it wouldn't be breaking the bank to get Julio, but, I mean, it's it's got to cost you, I would think, of maybe a first or some combination of, I don't know, the DeAndre Hopkins trade always throws me off. But, like, yeah. it, it, it would take, you know, a second and a third, something like that um, to get him. I mean, dude, I don't know about you, but, like, I want Atlanta to draft Kyle Pitts, and I just want to see that offense. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I mean, you know, they're in the NFC. Your Steelers and and the and the Colts don't have to worry about them. Like I, Calvin Ridley, Julio Jones, Kyle Pitts, and Matt Ryan, who I don't feel like is over the hill. Like, sign me up to watch that. They'll be a perfect um, seven and ten team that just <laughs> lights up the scoreboard and has yeah. disastrous endings, and we'll all get really really excited about them. But yeah, yeah no. Um, KB, uh, thanks so much, man. I, anytime that we get to hop, you got beers with Bowen coming up on Wednesday, right? Yeah. Tomorrow night, man. You were a huge, huge part of that over the year. So I appreciate you giving me a chance to plug that eight o'clock on YouTube on one Oh seven, five, the fan that's our station's YouTube page. So just head to my Twitter, K Bowen 1070. You can find it there and uh, it'll be fun throwing them back, talking some draft. And before I go, man, I do want to get your thoughts on the Steelers pick. Yeah, I mean, everything that um, I'm getting ready to have my guy Alex Gazora on from Steelers Depot and, um, you know, everything that, that that we're seeing is pointing towards Najee Harris to being the pick if he's there. Um, so and unless that's just major smoke screens and gaslighting and they're, you know, trying to dial up some to trade up or, or uh, you know, I don't know. But everything that I've seen, it's going to be Najee Harris. So uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm cool with it because, you know, the way that I'm talking myself into it is like, all right, if they like Najee that much – then there's obviously a reason, and obviously he's a stud. I mean, the the hurdle over your your Notre Dame Fighting Irish, you know, and you just, you think about that all the time. I'm sure, yeah. Um, but you know, you take the best overall spot, uh, best overall running back, you know, and then in rounds two, three, hell, even four, then then go get some linemen to be able to come in and be maulers and and plug and play. So that that's kind of if if we're gonna go with it, then that's the best route in my mind. So yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense. And then how early is too early for me to look at my 2022 mock draft on Sunday? I mean, if you're not doing it after the Colts pick or whatever happens uh, on Thursday night, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so I think you have to get your first one out of the way on Thursday morning-ish, you know, just to kind of get an idea for content to push over the weekend. Yeah. And then once the, the the Colts are wrapping up, that's when you're like full on, here's yeah. my big board for 2022. Boom. Publish. Here we go. All right. That's Kevin Bowen. Follow him at KBowen1070. Beers with Bowen tomorrow night for all your Colts draft needs on uh, 107.5 The Fan YouTube page. So, KB, I love you, brother. I'll talk to you soon. See you, man. Peace. Bye.